Hi, and welcome to the Huygens 3D Visualization webinar. My name is Kiefer, and as a software developer, I was involved in improving the 3D visualization tools in Huygens. Today, I'd like to give you an overview of these visualization tools and recent developments. During this webinar, you can submit the questions using the question form on the right-hand side of our SVI webinar page. After the webinar, we will answer your questions via email. There have been some big improvements and updates in the recently released Huygens 19.04 as well as in the upcoming Huygens 19.10, so there is much to discuss. Huygens currently has three different 3D renderers. The MIP or Maximum Intensity Projection Renderer, the SFP or Simulated Fluorescence Process Renderer and the Surface Renderer. These allow you to take a look at your sample in an interactive and intuitive way. The renderers can be used to generate individual images or to make animations using the internal animators or movie maker. I have recently been working on improving the performance of these renderers and they now have full GPU support allowing for much shorter rendering times and improved interactivity. Furthermore, new features have been added like a depth coded MIP, cutting planes in the surface and SFP renderers and much more adjustability in the SFP parameters. I will now go over each of these renderers and the movie maker to explain their functionality. Let's first take a look at the principles behind maximum intensity projection or MIP. The MIP renderer is the simplest of all the renderers and works based on the principle of maximum intensity projection. Rays are cast from a virtual viewpoint and pass through the object or objects. Along each ray, the maximum intensity is recorded and projected onto a virtual canvas. As you can see in this diagram, objects in the background can be projected through objects in the foreground as long as they have a higher intensity. As you can see, the object with an intensity value of 9 can be seen through the object with the intensity value of 4. By doing this, you are always looking at the most significant objects in the sample. So here we can see the actual MIP renderer tool. In this tool, you can interactively rotate, pan and zoom your object with the mouse. Individual channels can be turned on and off, and each channel can be given its own color. In the bottom right, you can see an option called Render Mode. This sets the quality of the rendering. Setting the quality to high will make the renderings look better, whereas Low Quality Mode will make the rendering process faster. A new feature in Huygens 19.10 is the so-called Depth Coding Color Mode. An example of this Depth Coding Color Mode is shown in the image on screen. Each point in the MIP is colored according to the distance from the viewer. As you can see, one end of this paramecium is colored blue since it's closer to the viewer, whereas the other side is colored red because it's farther away. A scale bar for this color mode can also be added to translate the colors into real life depths. As you can see on the left, we have a color bar here running from blue to red, where blue represents uh, a distance of 0 micrometers and red rest represents a distance of uh, 98 microns. Now let's look at the concept behind the surface renderer. The surface renderer is based on rendering isosurfaces. These are sets of points where the image intensity is constant. This constant is generally called the threshold. Since images are discrete, trilinear interpolation is used to determine the surface position on a sub-voxel level. In a diagram in the bottom left, you can see a small grid of voxel values for an imaginary image. The red line would be an isosurface for a threshold level of 4. As you can see, the surface is closer to the value 6 than to 0, and closer to 0 than to 12. In the diagram on the right, you can see how rays are cast from a virtual viewpoint, which can be stopped by the isosurfaces. The projected intensity depends on the local orientation of the surface and the illumination direction, using a combination of ambient, diffuse and specular reflections. And here we can see the actual SFP renderer tool. The object can be rotated, zoomed and panned just as in the MIP renderer. Surfaces can be shown for multiple channels with different colors and thresholds. The ISO surface for each channel generally segments your image into multiple discrete objects, and these can be separated visually by using a custom color range. Aside from ISO surfaces, a MIP can also be added, as well as an orthogonal slicer. The slicer shows the image intensities exactly at the slice position, while also functioning as a cutting plane. This means that the surface is cut open, allowing you to peer inside your object and slice through it in a natural way. 
Next up, we have the Simulated Fluorescence Process Render, or SFP Render. This renderer interprets an image as a distribution of fluorescent material, which can absorb light and then re-emit it at a different wavelength. In the diagram in the bottom left, you can see how the excitation light rays are absorbed by the red and green material. This attenuates the light intensity based on the local density and the excitation transparency of each material. The extinguished light forms natural shadows both inside the object itself as well as on the virtual table placed beneath the object. Once absorbed, the light is re-emitted from the different materials and may again be absorbed, this time based on the emission absorption transparency. All in all, this physical simulation leads to a realistic sense of depth and texture. The SFP process and the environment are highly configurable. The excitation, absorption and shadow transparencies can be set individually and per channel. Channels can be turned on and off and given different colors and thresholds. The table and background can be, different, can be given different colors and the size and distance of the table can be set. A bounding box can be added, added with custom rulers to indicate orientation and distance. So now I'd like to talk about uh, the SFP renderer and one of the most important settings which is called the penetration depth. This parameter sets the absorption and emission transparencies for all channels at the same time. In the example on the left, you can see a rendering of two mouse blastocysts with a low penetration depth. The excitation light is absorbed by the object almost immediately and the object appears very solid. The objects also cast a hard shadow. When we increase the penetration depth, we get the image on the right. The light now has a chance to penetrate deeper into the object, revealing internal structures and giving the image an overall softer and more transparent look. The shadow is now also softer and reflects the internal structure of the objects. A new feature in Huygens 19.04 is fully adjustable excitation light direction. Both the zenith and azimuth angle can be freely set and animated. The excitation light can be locked to the object or to the camera. This is called camera tracking. In this image we can see a paramecium oriented vertically on our table, casting a long shadow to the right of it. We will now rotate the table 360 degrees, first with the light locked to the object in the table, and then with light tracking the camera. So let's have a look. When locked to the object, shadows in the object and on the table do not change. When locked to the camera, the excitation light rotates with the viewer and the shadows flow through the object, highlighting different regions at different times. So this would be, ah, so here we have uh, locked to the camera or camera tracking and here we have locked to the table. All right, a new feature in Huygens 19.10 is the ability to add an ISO surface to the SFP scene. The surface affects the SFP simulation and the SFP simulation affects the surface, leading to a natural looking interaction. In this image, you can see how the surfaces cast a hard shadow on the table and the SFP material below it. You can also see how the SFP material partially obscures the surface and cast shadows on it. By using surfaces in the SFP scene, specific features of the objects can be accentuated. Another new feature in Huygens 19.10 is the ability to add cutting planes in the SFP renderer. These will virtually cut away parts of your image, allowing you to look inside. Up to six cutting planes can be added at the same time and each cutting plane can be placed in an arbitrary position and orientation. In the image in the top right, you can see the interface with which you can select and alter cutting planes. In the images on the bottom, you can see the effects of adding one and then two cutting planes to an SFP scene. The image on the left is the original scene, showing two blast assists with a low penetration depth. In the image in the middle, a single cutting plane was used with a plane normal pointing roughly towards the camera. In the image on the right, another cutting plane has been added, this time with a plane normal pointing roughly upwards. By combining cutting planes, you can cut wedges, cubes and slices, and many more. By animating these, you can make very information-rich animations as well. As mentioned earlier, all the rendering algorithms have recently been updated and now support GPU acceleration. This leads to large performance increases in all renderers, in most cases about a factor of 10 or more. As you can see, we generally expect a performance increase for switching to the GPU in the MIP renderer of about 4 times for low quality renders and about 50 times for high quality renders, as you can see at the bottom left. 
in the SFP renderer, we expect about a 10 times increase in performance across the board, and in the, sur and the surface renderer, we expect about a 15 times performance increase. By decreasing the render time for each frame, the renderer tools become more interactive and animations can be created much faster. Since we also updated the CPU code, Huygens will automatically dynamically switch between using CPU and GPU rendering. CPU rendering is only used in cases where the GPU is not available or when the GPU has insufficient memory for the image in question. Something to also note is that in previous versions of Huygens, most of the renderers used an orthographic projection, as opposed to a perspective projection. In the example on screen, you can see the difference between these projection methods. The image on the left shows a series of cube frames of equal sizes, using an orthographic projection. Here points and objects are projected straight onto the canvas, with rays running completely parallel to each other. It's like taking a picture of an object from really far away with a really high zoom level, so the field of view is effectively zero. As you can see, the light blue cube in the foreground has the exact same projected size as the orange cube in the background. This makes everything look very flat and unnatural. In the image on the right, you can see a perspective projection. The rays used are no longer parallel and an angular field of view is achieved. The light blue cube now appears larger than the orange cube since it is in the foreground. Furthermore, the cubes to the left and to the right of the central viewing direction look slightly different since we are effectively looking at them from different angles. Overall, this gives a much more natural sense of depth. Starting from Huygens 19.10, all renderers use perspective projection both on the CPU and on the GPU. In all the renderer tools we have seen so far, simple animations can be created directly in the tool itself. This is done by setting the parameters for two keyframes and then letting the tool interpolate all the parameters between these keyframes while rendering. To make more advanced movies, the Huygens Movie Maker can be used. This tool allows you to use any amount of keyframes and allows you to combine all of the renderers into a single movie. In the example image you can see how the keyframes can be added for the different renderers. These keyframes end up in the storyboard. In the timeline on the bottom you can monitor and tweak the progression of all the render parameters. In the preview window on the right you can get a quick preview of what your movie will look like when rendered. Once everything is to your liking, the movie can be rendered at a given quality level, resolution and frame rate. The resulting movie can be exported as an AVI video file or as a series of TIFF files containing the individual frames. To finish off, I would like to show you an animation of a chicken embryo. The embryo has been recorded using the Zeiss C1 light sheet fluorescence microscope from two different angles and multiple files. The resulting images were stitched and fused in Huygens. The animation I'm about to show was made using the Movie Maker using the renderer, then ISO surface, and moving cutting planes. Let's have a look. As you can see, the cutting plane allows you to look inside the object and get a good sense of its internal structure, while the ISO surface really gives a clear view of the overall shape of the object. I'd like to thank the following people for providing us with their microscopy images and allowing us to use them in our demonstrations. Thank you for watching this webinar about the Huygens 3D visualization options. If you have any questions, you can submit them now. If you are interested in trying out Huygens and its visualization tools for yourself, you can go to svi.nl slash download to get the latest version of Huygens. For more information, you can check out svi.nl slash visualization options or send an email to info at svi.nl. Thank you for watching.